Yes, thank you for the privilege of allowing me to speak up here. Um, I've been here early this morning. I kept hearing DJ and the, the worship team singing. And I'll tell you one thing I got out of it was if my people would just listen. It's all through the Old Testament. They would just listen to me. My prayer today is that you would listen to what God has given me. It's helped me. And at the end of the service, you'll have to make a decision. And I pray that God will lay that on your heart. It's my job just to preach God's word. It's, it's up to him to get the results. So may the Holy Spirit prompt you to make the right decision today. Listen up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you. Father, foremost, Father, Lord of our life. Thank you for loving us, guiding us, choosing us to be your children. May everything said here today, Lord, bring you glory. May your Holy Spirit convict, prompt the ones in here, Lord, that, that need what's being spoken today through me. It's in your son's precious name and his precious blood, Lord, that was spilled for our sake. Amen. All right, let's go to 1 Peter today. 1 Peter, I'm going to hit a lot of scripture, but I'm only gonna, we're only going to put up two, um, two pieces of scripture. 1 Peter. We're going to find out a couple things. Who Peter is, because inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wrote what we're going to hear read today. So knowing who wrote this, who was inspired by this, helps us understand. And forgive me if I don't move around a lot today. I just, I've had surgery, and technically, um, you could probably say I got a screw loose. But... And I've been around here a long time. Well, not a long time, and I've got to know many of you. And I can say the same about you. So, Amen. right? So, if you didn't have a screw loose, you don't, you don't belong in here, right? Some of us have more screws loose. Some of us need a new motor. <laughs> Hopefully you can get that today. I was telling Diane this morning, I... How you doing? She said, how you doing? I said, I, I, technically, I've got a screw loose. And she started to tell me everybody in the church who screws loose. Uh, I said, she didn't say that, but she said, we don't belong here if we don't have a screw loose. And that's the truth. Um, I guess there's no one in here would say that at the end of my life, I would say, I missed a point, you know? I don't think if I asked anybody to raise their hand, you would say, hey, I want to get there and say I missed it. I have wasted my opportunity. A meaningless life. No one wants to say that. We're going to find out today what Peter says about this. Let's go to 1 Peter 1. You can put that up on the screen. Now I'm reading, I've got a brand new Bible, and so... I mean, it's brand new. It's the Legacy Standard. It's the James MacArthur Bible. Um, they don't have that up there, so it's very close to it. You may see a couple words off, but it means the same thing. I threw my Bible away a couple weeks ago. Ten years old. Had notes all in it. Julie tells me to clean my truck out. I forget to, so I got to do it late one night. I just put everything in a black trash bag. Put all my important stuff. Um, a couple days later, it's in the back of my truck, and I go make a trip to the dump. It starts to rain. I throw all my trash in the dump. So that landfill now is a holy dump. <laughs> so um, you just have to get over it, you know. It's gone. First Peter 1. To those who reside as exiles... Scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to the obedience of Jesus Christ 
and the sprinkling of his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading, having been kept in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be re revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you rejoice with inexpressible and full of glory, receiving an outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, inquiring to know what the time, what time or what kind of time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating. Let's see. Concerning the salvation who prophesied the grace that would come, verse 10, made careful searches and inquiries. Verse 11, inquiring to know that what time, what kind of spirit of Christ within them was indicating he was predicting the sufferings of Christ and the glories that follow. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been declared to you and sent from heaven, things in which angels long to look at. Therefore, verse 13, that's where I stopped. Usually, I would just run right through that word, therefore. All right? When you see the word, therefore, in the Bible, go back and read what was up there or behind it. It's saying, hey, therefore, what I've just said, this is what happens. So, I go back to therefore. I didn't get past Peter an apostle, go back to verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Y'all know the life of Peter? He's an apostle now. Inspired by God, he's writing this. Peter, an apostle. Full cool word for apostle is someone sent on a mission, spread the gospel, proclaimed the good news. All right? Nothing big. It's just somebody proclaiming the gospel. But he starts it off introducing himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. If you know the story of Peter, you'll know at one time he was a big time loser. And I want to take you briefly, quickly, and we're going to get to our our, our text here, but briefly, you can write these down in study letter what he did. He was sent to proclaim the gospel. Now, if you want hope, you look at his life. All right? If you want hope, look at what he did. Now, before he says he's an apostle, John 135, this is before he leads us off here, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Jesus meets him and his brother. And he, he gives him a name. He said, I'm Peter. He said, no, you're Cephas. I'm Simon. Your name's Cephas. Which means rock. All right? This is before he wrote this. He's considered the rock. Jesus rolls up and names you the rock. That's pretty cool, you know? He becomes a leader, Matthew 17. 
he goes up with Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration and gets to see the glory of God. He's special. He's the man. Now, I don't know if you're watching the Chosen series, but I can't help but to keep this, the character in the Chosen Peter. They probably would have made him a little bigger. Don't you think? I don't think Peter was a small boy. But he's, he's becoming the man. All right? He's becoming God's go-to. Anybody that gets invited to go up to the Mount of Transfiguration and, and see the glory of God coming down, it's the second time it was ever done. You know he came down just glowing. All right? And he's now starting to be the man. Jesus looks at him and says, hey, don't tell anybody what you just saw. Now, you know you're cool if your inner circle's letting you keep secrets. You know? If the head man says, don't tell, you get, you're the man. You're becoming the man. And now we go all the way to Matthew 16, verse 13. Jesus was asking who do y'all think I am? Well, nobody answered. Peter said, I know. You're the Messiah. So Peter's always the first one to speak. He's becoming the leader of this group. All right? He said, you're the chosen one. All right? He answers the questions. He's starting to see all the miracles of Jesus. He's forefront right there with him. And over the Luke 19, 28 through 40... He sees the healing, all right? He sees the cult that they called for. Jesus told him to get a cult. I'm, I'm coming in. They get the cult. Peter's the rock now. He's the stud of the inner circle. He's thinking, this is huge. This is our king. This is our Messiah, right? I'm, I'm right here. I'm his rock. I'm going to protect him. And they bring the cult in. Jesus, you know the story, arrives in a on a donkey. Now, I don't know a lot about horses. I know they're expensive. But I know a horse that's never been ridden doesn't like to be sat on. And the Son of God said on him, he won't buck, will he? You know? When Jesus touches you, you won't buck. You won't make a move. And that's the power. And this is what Peter is witnessing of. Now we go all the way Let's call this Thursday. He's hanging out with, with Jesus. And he's seeing he's the go-to guy. He's telling Jesus, I'm not going to let you down. Dude, I got you. And he would fight at the drop of a hat. He'd probably be like our Tim. You know? You get in trouble, he's going to be swinging first. And that's what I like about him. But now it's Thursday. They're in the garden. Jesus is telling them, hey, they're going to come arrest me. They're going to crucify me. Peter said, no, I'm not going to let that happen. He actually rebuke, rebukes Jesus. Now, how big of a stud do you think he thought he was? He's going to rebuke the Son of God. He's going to rebuke the Creator. He says, no, they're not going to. Well, Jesus looks at him and says, he rebukes him. He says, they are going to do it, and there's nothing you're going to do about it. You're wrong. So, Peter's telling him, I'm your guy. I'm your guy. I'm not going to let this happen. Now, we're, they're, we're in the garden now. And his boy is asleep. Peter's asleep. He's the go-to guy. He's the leader. They come arrest Jesus. What What happens? Peter takes the sword out, chops the guy's ear off. Jesus reaches down, puts it right back on. Now, keep in mind, Peter's seeing all this. Now, he loved to fight, but he's, he's the man. He's still the man. And the big shift here, Luke 22, it says, Peter, after they arrested Jesus, there's a big shift in here from being the man So when they got Jesus, it says that Peter followed at a distance. 
He ain't up there no more. I ain't getting involved in that. After all Peter had seen, he's following at a distance. That's the big shift. Mark 16. No, it's Friday. They've taken Jesus. Peter's lost all hope. Everyone's gone. He's crying. What's he do? He went back fishing. That's how he drowned his sorrows. He went back fishing. All hope was gone. Faith is faith is gone. He's seen all of his miracles. I'm your guy. And the first sign of anything going on, he runs. All right? He failed, failed miserably. How many of you could raise your hand and say that one time I had just failed miserably? That would be if you're truthful, everybody in the audience. He's failed miserably. Jesus was crucified. Walking to the cross. Where was Peter? Looking from a distance. Mark 16, let's take it to the tomb. Jesus has risen from the dead. Angel tells him to go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell them. Go tell the disciples. And he says, and Peter. Make sure you tell him. Hope redemption. John 21, 4. Sunday's coming. We need to, when we look at Peter's life, we need to re realize when all hope is lost and failure, living hope is on its way. And this is who's rightness. This is why I want y'all to know who's rightness. Now, Peter and John and disciples run to the tomb. But if you read that, you'll see that Peter didn't make it there first. And it doesn't mean necessarily that he was the slowest of them. I think Peter didn't want to run into the tomb because of his shame. Knowing, thinking Jesus might be in there, he was going to rebuke him, condemn him. You know, when you come here, the first thing you need to leave at the door is your shame. All right? It says Peter went in, stooped down, saw that he wasn't there. All right? I seem to, when I was reading this, I, I'm thinking Peter's seen the miracles. He's seen everything. And it says in Scripture, blessed are the ones that haven't seen Jesus and believe. So if you know what happens in Peter's life, we are actually more blessed that we haven't even seen Jesus than being actually with him. All right? Peter saw the Lord. And we know the end of the story that they were on a boat. And I don't think they still believe Jesus was coming back. But he stood on the shore. And he yells at them, hey children, hey little kids, I'm here. Scripture says, it doesn't say this, but it means this. Peter pulled a force gump. You've seen the movie. Over he went. He didn't yell Jenny, but he, he took off. All right? He's rebuked. He's rebuked Christ. He's denied him three times. And Jesus told him, before tonight's over, you're going to deny me three times. I don't know about you, but it's been more than three times for me. You ever heard somebody talk about your Lord and you just walk away? You ever heard somebody blaspheme God's name and you just walk away? You ever heard somebody say a curse word, taking the Lord's name in vain, and you just walk away like it didn't happen? Right? Peter denied him three times. But Jesus is waiting on the beach for him. And I'm just going to close this part, of the, the first part of the story else story, he forgave him. All right? He put him back to work. 
go tend my flock, go feed my sheep, he tells him. He didn't ask him about his past. All right? Let us hope. Peter sees the hope. He's been reconciled with God. And he goes on to write 1 Peter, 2 Peter. What we're going to read. Now we're going to get to the, the main part here. Go to verse 13, 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, having heard everything that we've heard about Peter, about us being exiles, guys, this is, this is not our home. This is not your home. If your heart is in this world, there's no way heaven could be your home. If your heart is in this world, your heart, your heaven cannot be home. It says we are exiles in verse 1. He's our father. Verse 3, ob obtaining an inheritance. Peter's saying, hey, hope, a living hope. You have been grieved in verse 6 by various trials. It didn't say you might be grieved. It says you will be grieved with various trials. There's people in this church hurting from loved ones that have passed away. You will be grieved by various trials. So that the proof of your faith in verse 7, being more precious than gold. All right, For the proof of your faith, you will go through trials. So therefore, in verse 13, having girded your loins, and here's the meat of the sermon. If you're taking notes, having girded your loins. When you see that word girded loins, the guys kind of wore dresses back then, not like they are today. It's probably a sackcloth. And when they girded their loins, they would pull them up, tighten their belt for battle, getting ready, all right? You see, girding up means get ready. Therefore, having girded your minds, getting your mind ready for action, be sober, fix your hope completely on grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which yours was in ignorance, but be like the Holy One who called you. Be holy yourselves also in your conduct. As it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you address the Father, the one who impartially judges the time of your sojourn, that word sojourn, is your, it, we're, this is a temporary stay for us here. We're exiles. We're citizens of heaven. If you are a, a child of God, you are a citizen of heaven. This is not your home. Knowing that you were redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your futile ways. Inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but appeared in the last days for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope in God since you have obedience to the truth, purify your souls for love of the brothers without hypocrisy. Fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. That is, though the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all the glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was proclaimed to you as good news. My, the meat of this whole thing is Peter telling us in verse 13. Of verse 18. Knowing that you were redeemed with corruptible things. Like silver or gold from your what? Let's see. I know what it says on my. For you know that it was with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of your life. You were redeemed, you were saved. I would think it was saved, was saved from our sin, saved from ourself, saved from judgment. Many versions say. 
you were saved. God is saving you from a life of futility, a pointless, meaningless life. Like I said, who in here wants to live a meaningless, pointless life? A life that can not be used. That's what that word futile means. All right? So, that being said, it sounds, that's a bold statement. It can be offensive. Here's a statement that I want you to write down. Life is futile apart from knowing and enjoying God as your father. Life is useless. Life is futile apart from knowing and enjoying God as father. Life is meaningless, pointless, unless you know and enjoy God as father. That's what Peter is telling us here. 1 through 12 is a living hope. 13 through 25 is telling us. It's going to give us four things, Peter. What I pulled out of here, four things. If we want to turn this into a positive thing, apart from knowing God, life is futile. Apart from knowing and enjoying God, you're living a life of futility. And we can put the positive spin on this, knowing and enjoying God as Father leads to a full and abundant life. All right? There's four things that I think are in this text that will lead us to a full life. And as we go through them, this is the recipe for a full life. This is a recipe for hope, for love, and to get to the end of your life and see it meaningless, this can change today. You have a purpose. You know, at one point, Peter's life was pointless, meaningless, empty. Let's get to the first one, the four steps to a full life. Verse 13. Therefore, having girded your minds... That's getting your mind ready for action. Be being sober, fix your hope. Fix your hope on who? Fix your hope on God. Fix your hope. First step to a full life is hope. Now, some of you might be thinking, I, I don't have hope. How do I get hope? Is it emotion? You just can't give somebody hope. I don't have hope. You can. Hope, you can generate hope. God made us, God designed us. You can generate hope. All right? It says, gird up your minds for action. Being sober in spirit. Fix your hope on God. We can grow it by not allowing things up in here. Now, Casey just told me right before I walked up here, she's doing a study on that. It can end here. All right? Prepare your mind. Be in sober spirit. That doesn't mean don't drink alcohol. What it does mean is a sober person is unstable in their mind. Okay? Not all there. You make some stupid decisions. When you, when you get... When you get drunk, like a drunk person, they're just unstable in their thinking, in and out, in and out. It's saying, don't be like that. Fix your hope on God. We need to guard our mind. You know, we go to Philippians 4, 8, guard our minds, what's coming in here? Philippians 4, 8, if you can pull it up, whatever's good, whatever's loving, stick to that. Finally, brothers, it's what is true, whatever's noble, right, pure, it, Admirable, fix these things. Think about these things. Think about what you're thinking about. I've said that 10 times. Think about what you're thinking about. If you're sitting at home 
scrolling through social media, and I did an experiment. I hate to admit it, but I've been out for a while. And you get to a point you can't watch so much TV, right? There was a while I didn't see but two humans, you know? And it was Jaden and Julie. I mean, the UPS guy coming, I got excited. And, <laughs> but there's, I wanted to do an experiment. I wanted to see if I fill my mind with this, how I'm going to act. If I fill my mind with this, what comes in? And I'm going to make a statement, and there's no way you can challenge me on this one. If you sit all day and watch social media and TikTok, I know it's going to stink for some of you. You watch, and I did, you can do TikTok. You see kids doing that? You get to flipping, and there's a movie, a short movie. If y'all don't know what TikTok is, it's a short movie, short movie, short movie, like 10 seconds. Ding, 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 ding. You can get mesmerized. I see some of you shaking your head. Look. Eight out of 10 TikToks have a sexual content in them. Parents, if you're allowing your kid to watch TikTok, he will not have any hope. All right? His hope is going to be in something you don't want it to be in. Eight out of ten take you right up to the edge. Now, there's two. The other two are trick shots. No, one's a trick shot. One's a car crash or a golf cart crash. I personally love them. I love seeing somebody wrecking a golf cart. They're fine. They don't, they don't put the ones where they get really hurt. But you click, 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 click. Next thing you know, you're thinking of junk. All right? Now, the opposite of that, is I fill my truck full of Christian music and Christian podcasts and sermons. And I did a week of that. And man, I, I was ready to fight the devil with a fight hell with a water pistol. I mean, that you just you get different thoughts. Set your mind. It says, gird your mind, set your mind for what you're putting in your mind. Hope in God, hope in what's good and what's admirable and loving, and you'll start thinking different. Verse 14, Peter says, as obedient children, not being conformed to your former lust. He's saying, have hope. You don't, you didn't know then what you know now. If we're born again, Christians, you didn't know then what you know now. Think about that. Your thinking should be different. Back then you had an excuse. And then here it says it's passed down from your forefathers. You didn't know then what you know now. If you are in Christ, if you're born again, you, you would know different. Fix your hope on what's good. You start fixing your hope on God, hope starts to rise. You know, you think about your mortgage, your dog's got the runs, your wife's mad at you, your kid's got three F's. Your hope is going to go down. You start filling your mind with godly things, your hope starts to rise. Hope in God is the first thing for a fulfilled life, an abundant life. You know, you're going to get what you put in. Second step to a, a full life. Second step to a full life. Now we need to fix our hope on God. This is a tough one. It says, as obedient children, not being conformed to the former lusts, which was yours in ignorance. You didn't know then what you know now. 15, but like the Holy One who called you, be, be what? Be holy. Yourselves also in all your conduct, because it's written not just because it is, because it was written, and it's written today, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Number two, second step to a full life, be holy, like God. Now, what's that mean? Holy, holiness, there's a thousand sermons on holy and holiness. 
Be like God. Let's put it better. Like father, like son. Like mother, like daughter, right? Be like God. Verse 3, verse 18, verse 4, God is my father. As born again children. Be like my father. Right? Be like the one who saved you. Peter says, be holy like God. Now, what's being holy look like? All right? Now, you can say, like father, like son. That could be good. That could be bad, depending on who the father is. Right? If he's an evil father, a selfless father, no integrity, probably wouldn't be a good statement if I said, DJ, like father, like son. But it says, be holy like I am. There's a different father here. Be like God, the perfect father. He's perfectly, what, just, merciful, wise. He's perfectly faithful. Wouldn't, wouldn't we want it be said of us, like father, like son, like father, like daughter? Who in here would not want somebody to say, man, they're not like the Father, the Father God. I don't think anybody would. God wants this for us. He wants us to be holy. He designed us to be like Him. He wants this for us. It's the good life. It's the full life when we're holy and we live like God. Right? I didn't, I wouldn't say I had the, the best Father. But there's some traits that I got from him that are good. There's some traits I got from him, you know, pre-salvation, bad, you know. Would I want to be said like Father Alexa? I don't know. But I want to be known, and you ought to be known, and you all want to be known like your Father in heaven. Be holy in your conduct, okay? Verse 17, verse 17 And if you address the Father, the one who impartially judges you according to one's work, conduct yourself in what? Fear. If it says that. Conduct yourself in fear. Third step to a full life. Conduct yourself in fear. Now, if you're hearing that for the first time, when I first read it, I'm saying, how do I hope in fear at the same time? How can you hope in something and fear what you're hoping in? That's not what it means. All right? It's a different fear. Now, I will say this. This fear that they're talking about here isn't meant for who is talking about it here. If you're born again and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you shouldn't fear God at all. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you should fear judgment. Because it says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we're all going to stand before God. And without Jesus being there, to saying that's he's mine. He's mine. Fear that. But for Christians, children of God, there's no fear. But what the fear it's talking about here, it says, because it's right, it's right and good to fear someone when you love them. It's right and it's good to fear someone when you love them. If you love God, it's right and good to fear Him. Now I'll give you an illustration or an example. I fear my wife. Pre-salvation, big time. Um, but I, what I fear 
I fear disobeying. Where's she at? Dishonor. I fear disobeying, dishonoring. Bringing shame to her name. For how much she loves me, I fear doing anything that would show her how precious her love for me is. That's the fear they're talking about here. That's the fear that God's talking about. Fear of disobeying, dishonoring. What would it say to her if I did something like that? It wouldn't look good. That's the kind of fear that we're talking about here. If you address the Father as one, conduct yourself in fear during the time of your sojourn, your temporary stay here, fear doing anything that would bring shame and honor to God. That's the deepest love that you could have for somebody. Fear doing something that's going to bring shame to them. But Peter did. There's redemption. Peter and Jesus did that on the beach. But fear doing anything that's going to bring shame. Fear, to me, is a critical part of love because fear can keep you from doing a lot of things, right? Fear can keep you from making some stupid decisions that's going to hurt or bring shame to somebody else's name, right? So the third step is conduct yourself in fear that you wouldn't do anything for the love of God to shame his name. Non-Christians, we've all sinned and we've all fallen short. But there's a Savior that can take that fear of judgment away from you. Right? When you make Him Father, when you make Him your Lord and your Savior, that fear changes from fear of judgment to fear of disobeying your father. You know, my father, I, back then, they used to allow you to discipline different, you know? And I love my dad dearly. But I really didn't, I didn't love him enough to think about my actions how they were going to affect his name. I didn't. I feared what he would do to me, you know? But I fear doing anything to my wife to take her, the, the love that she has for me, might keep me from doing a lot of things. And that's the, that's the fear that God wants you right here, that you love him so much that you don't want to say anything, do anything that's going to make him look bad. Because everybody's watching, they're waiting for it, right? So hope in God, be holy like God. Fear God. Now, we fear doing anything. I want to give you an illustration it's not a perfect illustration. I've said it in my head about 10 times. Here's the fear I'm talking about. Imagine an 18-year-old girl kidnapped from her father, her wealthy father. And he asked for a ransom, a payment to get her back, a payment to release her. For everything he has. Well, you take one of my daughters and you ask me to give everything I got, I will. Watches, cars, and this this guy give it all. He went and collected it, his wedding bands, all of his treasures. And at a point in time, 
at a pointed place in a field. He met the captors. He put all of his possessions in the field. She walks out with the captor, with her people holding her hostage. They gather up all her dad's possessions, and the dad's watching them across the field. She turns around, puts her arm around one of the captors, walks away. She looks back at her dad and goes, Sucker! Fear saying that to God. When you use God's grace as a license to sin and you take the precious blood, what God has done for you, and live a life of sin, that's what you're telling God. Sucker! That's what I fear. Fear saying that to God. What he's done for us, and you, you take it, we take it so lightly. Fear taking what he did so lightly that he gave his only son, laid him on a cross for us, and we continue to live in sin. That's what you're doing. You're taking his precious sacrifice. It says it down in here, his precious blood, and you're saying, ah, not good enough. I'm going to keep on sinning. Or some, it's a license of sin. God's grace. Oh, he'll, he'll forgive us. He'll forgive us. He will. But not for practicing it. Fear saying that to God. That's the opposite fear we're talking about here. Sucker. I would, I would hate to hear that. Last step, number four. Verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth, purify your souls. That's getting saved. That's being redeemed. That's being restored. For love of the brothers without hypocrisy. Four step to a full life. Fervently love one another. You want a full life? Have hope. Fear the Lord. Number four, love one another from the heart. Earnest. Love one another. He's talking to born-again Christians. When you are born again, you have a new life. You got a new attitude, new thinking. You didn't know what then, what you know now. You also get a new love. An unnatural love for one another. It's, it's not natural to love certain people. You know, I'm sure that Somebody in here probably finds it hard to love me. But people are hard to love. Some people. But it didn't say that here. It says love one another. Like a brother. All right? A new life is new love. All right? It says it's earnest love in some, in some Bibles. Stretched strained how many of you strained to love somebody that's it it's not natural you have to do it you have to strain to love somebody all right um it's a born again love now here's what i found born again and love for one another run parallel with salvation. You cannot tell me that you don't love and not be a Christian. Those two go together. They run together. It says that if we're born again, if we're born again, if we're purified, if we're cleansed, love one another. 
So if you don't have love for the brother, you don't have love for each other, Christ is not in you. It can't be. It says it right there. That's hard. But you, there's just no way. There's an, uh, an illustration, of a story I want to share with you. This, I had it, but I can't pull it up. So I did it on my phone. You ever heard of a guy named John Newton? Yeah? John Newton. Wrote, what did he write? He wrote Amazing Grace. He also did some other things. Um, he wrote a letter. A lot, of, a lot of stuff. But John Newton was a ex-slave captain on the slave ships. He was all for slavery. All right? Until his conversion, until God reached down and saved him and gave him a new heart, a new love. And that's what happens when God, when God touches you, you get, a, you get a new heart. John Newton got a new heart. He got some new thinking. Well, he had a, this letter called Own Controversy. He had another pastor write him a letter and say, hey, I got this other pastor that's saying some bad things. Tell me how to address him. What do I do? You know? Well, John Newton, he's coming from being a slave captain to a born-again Christian. And I want to read to you just a part of what John Newton tells him to do. He said, If you account him a believer, though greatly mistaken in the subject of debate between you, let's quit arguing, you know, quit arguing. The words of David to Joab concerning Absalom are very applicable. Deal gently with him for my sake. Love him. It's not natural. The Lord loves him and bears with him. Therefore, you must not despise him or, or treat him harshly. The Lord bears with you likewise and expects you that you should show tenderness to others from a sense of much forgiveness. God's forgiven you. For forgiveness for yourself. Listen to this. In a little while, you'll meet him in heaven. He will be then dear to you than the nearest friend you have upon earth. This person that you think you don't love and you're arguing with, if they're a believer, one day you'll be in heaven with them for all eternity. You've got to be with somebody in here. Think about spending eternity with them. You're going to love them more dear than a brother here or sister here on earth. Anticipate that period in your thoughts, and though you may find it necessary to oppose their errors, which you can, view him personally. You know, we can't even, we can't even argue anymore. You ever notice that? You just bring up any topic, and there's 50 opinions, and if you say something somebody don't like, it goes into a mad argument. We've seen the news. That's why I don't even argue anymore. But if you look upon him, if you look upon him as an unconverted person, the state of enemy of God, so on. But treat him like he's going to be your dear brother in heaven, which he will be. So, new life, new love. It's easy. Now, it's, again, it's hard to love people. But it's not natural. God gives us that ability to love one another. And as a church, when we love each other, it shows. Non-Christians come in here and they see us loving on each other or they see us bickering in a corner. They see Christ or they don't see Christ. All right? Love for one another is us joining together 
to spread God's gospel, to spread his good news. That's how we do it. Now, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. That's why it's not natural. Something that you have to ask God for. So, there's, you know, it's, it, it can be harsh, but know that you too will be living with Christ forever. So love is a critical step to a full life. All right? We'll get to the end here. Verse 24, for all flesh is like grass. It's all in its glory like the flower grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. God, this, this world's going like this. I'm 55, and it seems like six months ago I was 20. Life is fading, right? Life is fading. Do you want to get to the end of your life and saying, I missed it? You know? Or do you want to get to the end of your life and say, I got it. I got it. Now, if you don't know the Lord, you'll get to the end of your life, and you'll say, I missed it. I missed it. You don't want that. You do not want that. Non-Christian, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I beg you, do not leave here today without knowing God as your Father. Knowing God and enjoying Him as Father. All right? I'm just preaching the Word. God, He takes care of the results. You know? If you want a full life, do it. All right? Why do you want to go and be known or get to the end of your life and saying it was just futile? You don't have to. Your life will be full when you know and enjoy God as Father. So, I'm going to give you two choices today. And it's what you get to do with it. You can reject what's been said. You can reject what God said in His Word. You can reject what a man that's been redeemed, that's walked with the Lord said. You don't have to live a futile life. You don't have to get to your life at the end and, and say, man, I did all this for nothing. You know, hell is an eternal separation of God. It's just a place where there will, you won't have any access to God at all. Whatever you think hell is, it's just you won't have any access to God. God's not there. And I can't imagine being in a place where I don't have access to God. But you can reject what's just said, or you can say, you know, I just don't believe it. You know? I don't believe what Jesus has done for me. Or you can say, I believe some of it. You know? What I've said in the past, in my early years, I believe some of it. I believe a little bit of it. Sounds good, but I'm just going to go on living my life like it is. Yeah. That's what most teenagers think. I, it's good. I believe in God. But I'm just going to live my life the way I want to live it. You're yelling, sucker, sucker. That's what you're saying. I'm going to live my life just the way I want to live it. Fear saying that to God. Guys, fear using his precious blood as a lifestyle of sin. Knowing you can have a full and abundant life with Christ. A, a full entire life for all eternity. You know, there's some of you right now, and I've been in your spot before, May 19th, 1990. I heard God pulling at me saying, hey, 
It's time to change. It's time to get a full life. That's the night I met the Lord. You know? What Satan's telling you is it's fine. Don't do nothing. Wait. But the cool thing is, God at his best can restore you to a full life. And save you, verse 13, from a futile, meaningless life. That's a decision you can make. Again, Christians, we didn't know then what we know now. Don't go back. Unbelievers, fear meeting God one day and saying, sucker, you did all this for me. Fear that. Now, as Casey comes, I'm just going to, if God's dealing with you, I won't have to prod you to come down here. Or you don't have to come down here. You can tell me at the end of the service, I don't, you'll make it known. When God got a hold of me, we told some people. Me and Julie got saved, saved the same night. Okay? God says you won't be ashamed. Now, Christians, we've heard the recipe for a full life. Fear, disobeying, dishonoring, putting shame to the, God's word. But no, he took Peter and did a mighty work with him, didn't he? So DJ, DJ, you went into some prayer. And if God's dealing with your heart, just come down here. If not, deal with him right where you're at. But I will tell you, if you don't tell anybody, it's probably not authentic. But fear, fear the Lord and know he loves you and he wants a full life for you. DJ?